want to do the project that goes with this, which is server-side template injection. Now, I used to start this project with you setting up your own server, but I took that out. There's no real need for it. You can just use my server. However, it's on port 6060, so if you're on the City College wireless network, it will block that. And I had to go through my VPN to get around that. So here's what you have listening on my server at port 6060. You can search for things. So if you search for, like, Fred, it's supposed to be searching a database, but it's fake. It will always tell you it found whatever you're searching for. It's a very simple uh, search engine. So if I search, um, it's disturbingly slow. should tell me it found Fred. Hmm. Well, let me open another one. Maybe, that, maybe it's not really able to connect to my server. No, there it goes. User Fred exists. Okay, whatever you search for, it will find it. So that's fine. Now the point is, you can hack it. So the first thing you do is fingerprinting it, and here's uh, a way to find out what the back end framework is. So if I put in this, curly brace, curly brace, two times two, and search for that, then, hopefully it won't keep being so slow, but if it does, I won't... Uh, it does eventually reply. I don't know what can be making it so slow, but anyway, um, it will eventually reply and it'll tell me it's four. So that tells me this has a vulnerability like SQL injection, like the other injection vulnerabilities we've seen, where it doesn't filter out these curly braces. It lets me put in special characters that cause it to interpret this as something to be evaluated and it evaluates it. And that means I can inject commands in this language called server-side templates, just like we could inject commands before at the bash shell line or in the language called SQL. So again, we can take over the server, but we have to learn how to use this, this screwy language. Now, the next thing is you have to decide which backend framework it's using. So you try these injections and see how they work. And let's see if this ever responded. Hmm, all right, it looks like it really is taking forever for some reason. Let me load more tabs of it. Um, so I can start a couple more of these searches going. All right, so the, the way this um, fingerprinting works is I start with this one. Dollars, quote, seven times seven. So it's dollars, curly brace, seven, star seven. And you want to see if that one gets evaluated. Ah, now it's finally moving. I don't know what happened there. Probably something about the City College Network. So it just echoed it back without evaluating the content in the bracket. So this injection did not work. It just interpreted as literal text. So that means on this chart, I take the red line. This injection failed, so I take the red line. Now I try double curly brace, seven times seven. Okay. Oops, seven star seven, there. And I searched for that, and that evaluated it to 49. 7 times 7 is 49. So that injection succeeded. So I'm up here. Um, now, this looks like the same thing again. No, 7 times apostrophe 7. Okay. Now I'm going to see if I can do a multiplication of a string. So I'll go back. I'd like to close this tab, but somehow the close tab thing is gone. All right. Um, so I'll go back here, and I want to put apostrophes around that 7. All right. Search. And now it did that multiplication. 7 times a string is 7 sevens. So this also processed that. So I follow the green line. So this is server is running Jinja 2. That's the point of this. You can determine what server-side technology is used by this fingerprinting procedure. So now that we know, it's Jinja 2. <coughs> okay. Now, we can now exploit the server, and all we really need to know is that Jinja 2 runs on Python 3. And the real vulnerability we're going to exploit is a vulnerability in Python 3. So, all we need is a Python 3 command line, and we can just use this as a Mac I've got here. So I can just open a normal command prompt. Python 3 is already included in the Mac. Uh, if you, you could also use a Linux machine. So let me just clear this. And let's enter Python 3. And we can just use it in immediate mode to see this vulnerability. So I can set a string equals to something like hello. 
and that's a string object. You can do a dir of s to see what methods are available for a string, and there's a lot of them. You can see if it's alpha, is it numeric, you can make it uppercase, you can make it lowercase, you can do a lot of things with a string. But the thing I want to do right now is find out what type of object that is, so I want to use this class method. Now the way you use a method is you do s dot and then the name of the method. This will give me the class of it, and the class of course is string, str. So this object, hello, is a string. So that's fine. Now I could also run a method like lower, and if I want to do that, this gives me the name of the function, the meaning of the function, tells me where it is, but if I want to actually run the function, I have to use open and close parentheses, and now it performs that function on the string, changing this capital hello to a lowercase hello. So that's, um, all right, so that's what we've done there. We've seen the structure of uh, this. So now we're going to walk up the hierarchy. We did it as class, and that is a string. But you can ask, what class is the class? And that, um, oops, I've been missing the uh, underscore on at the end. That is a type. So this is type, and you can also do S class base, and that is an object. So what you have done here is you've walked up the hierarchy. Here is the hierarchy of things in Python 3. You have a string, the class of it is a string, the type of that is a class, that's a type, the class of the string is a type, and the base is object, and this is the root of the entire tree. So you can start with a string, walk up the, um, did s change? No, s lower did not change s, it just evaluated s lower. I only have changed s if I put it, that's a good question, if I print s, s is still capital. Even though I did s lower, that calculates s lower, but it doesn't store it in s. If I wanted to store it in s, I'd have to do like this. And now that would change it. Okay, good. So, now I've walked up to the root of the entire tree, and now I can go down the tree and find other things. And this is going to turn out to be magic. So, um, if I want, so, for example, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to enumerate the subclasses. So I'm going to import OS and subprocesses here, which are functions that will just let me enumerate subclasses so I can see the structure of Python. All right, now I can do this, S class base, that's object, I can do the subclasses of the object, just to see what available function classes exist. And there are a ton of them. These are all the functions that apply to an object, the root of the entire tree, the object class. All right, now, this will save that list of classes in an object named C. Just like I renamed the string, uh, I can take my hello is a string, class and base takes me up to object, and this performs subclasses, and so I don't have to keep typing it. I'm going to store all that junk in an object named C. Okay, and now I can see the length of C. And it is 194, so there are 194 objects in there. 194 possible classes that are subclasses of the uh, um, base object. And by the way, it doesn't match the number I had here. In different versions of Python 3 will have different numbers. So now I can list all those function names. For each of those C objects, I could print their name with this loop. And this is only going to do the first 185 of them, but that's enough. Um, all right. So there they are, you see a number and where they are. And I, the one I want to find here is catch warnings. Catch warnings is one function that is going to be useful to me. So I run a loop, I get the name, and I check to see if the name contains the word warning. And if it does, then I print it out. So instead of printing all 184 of them, I print out just the one that has warning. So something's gone wrong here. Um, let's see this. See if I can copy it. Maybe I'm going to have to copy them one by one. No, there we are. All right. So it was 184 is scratch warnings on this system, and it'll be different on each system in principle. So once I've found that number, now I can enumerate the built-in methods. The first one, I have to substitute that number, though. 
So the correct number for my system, which is 184. All right. Now I can do X module and X module built-ins. And you'll see the point of this. It's going to make it possible to do magic. Um, uh, X module built-ins produces another big blob of results. And so, again, I'm going to take X module built-ins and put it in an object called B, and then look at the length of B and the class of B, so I can don't have to hunt through hundreds of objects again. All right, so 153 things in there. This is a dictionary containing 153 objects. So I want to find import, so I do the same thing again. I have a loop to go through them all and look for one that contains the word import. And the point of this is... I am able to find the import function. The import function imports a library. What this means is, since I was able to inject um, into Python 3, I'm able to add strings to a Python 3 object that will import a library on the code that the developer did not put there. This is unbelievable power. I can not only run commands that the developer didn't want me to run, I can import libraries that the developer did not want to import. That's why I went through all this rigmarole to find my way to the import function from just a string. So now you can perform code execution. This is going to import OS and then execute system date. Even if the developer did not import OS, which they probably didn't, I can import OS and then I can execute commands. So this is how you move from this Python 3 framework to command execution and the system, in a system shell. This is going to run the system the date function. And there it is, the date function, followed by zero, which is the return value of this thing. So now I can I have key exe uh, command execution. And so, um, all right, there's a flag defined there. It doesn't matter. Now we can do this in server-side template injection. With this, we can take this and evaluate that on my server. So let's feel the, feed that in. and see it worked. It told me the type was string, so I was able to take a string.class. So I'm able to inject Python 3 code inside here, and it will be executed on the server. So now I just have to find the Python 3 code that does the job, and it's going to turn out, this is going to give me the, we're just going to do the same thing we just did straight in Python here on this website. Uh, in fact, I can probably tear this off Cancel. I don't want to do that. I want to tear this off. Okay. Make these two both fit on the screen at the same time. There's my instructions. All right. And here's my search box. Which I want to move to the right. If I can uh, figure out how to make this window. Ah, here we go. All right. There we go. This will be better. So I can copy this and put it here. All right. So when I search for that, it finds it's a base string. Um... All right, anyway, now I'm going to use MRO as another way to get up to the object. So um, I'm going to do this one. Method resolution order is another way to get up to the base string. That's what I had to do before. And it's doing this thing where it freezes. Seems to just do that at random. Let's try another one here. Yep, okay. Now I've made it to object. This is what I wanted. I've made it up to the object, which is the root of the whole tree. Now I want the third item on this list. So that's going to be, it's 0, 1, and 2. So object number 2 here is going to be the object in that list. So that's this. And if it's taking too long, I'll just start another one. All right. This is how I now made it up to the top of the Python hierarchy to the object at the top of the tree. Now I just need to walk down. So I do all everything I did before, and now I do subclasses, which is where I can see the um, classes that are underneath the object container. So I'll go back here and put that in. Now I get a long list of all these things, as before, and the one I want is the one um, I can use loops as well. This is going to give me the first 10 of them. 
Let's so I don't have to see them all. This is a four and an end four. This is the uh, Jinja two syntax to make a loop. And so now I got the first 10 of them, okay. Now I can print out the number and the method names rather than the types. So I take, uh, and I'm gonna have count with an index i, and then I'm gonna print i, and then I'm gonna print out the name here, i.name. So this will give me a printout that's easier to read. Right, so now I got zero, one type, zero type, one week ref, two week table. I got various uh, objects here with numbers. And what I'm looking for uh, is file. File is one you can use. It was 40 when I did it there, and it's 40 again here. So file is here. So I can do file operations like reading a file. We'll need that later. So that's the thing to remember. We found the file thing. Now we're going to find catch warnings because this is what's going to get us to import. So this mess will read the subclasses and it'll find one that has warning in the name and print out the number and the name of it. So run this one. And there it is, it's 59 catch warnings. All right, now this is how I'm gonna execute ls on the system. Now I've found that thing 59, subclasses number 59, um, from that, I can, I can set x equal to this mesh. A string, class, and um, mro number two gets me to the root of the entire Python tree, the object. Then I go to the subclass number 59, and that is the um, catch warnings method. So I call that x. Then I go there, and I go into built-ins import, import os to import the os library, and now I can do os system ls to execute the system command ls. Now in here, I can execute bash shell commands. This is just like the other injections you've done before, but this is you, you can see perhaps in more detail why you have to have all this other code around it to get to the point where you're executing system commands. So here, I can now execute ls, but it didn't see, the result is zero, and this is because it executed the ls command, but it doesn't print it on the screen. This is like the blind SQL injection we've done in the web security class. It did ran the command, but it didn't put the output anywhere I could find it. So we need to exfiltrate the data. So here's how you do it, and that's why we're gonna need that file command. You repeat the process, let me make this wider there. So you set x equal to this subclasses thing, then you go to buildings export. Now you actually, instead of doing ls, you do ls greater than temp out. This will take ls and put it in a file, slash temp, slash out. And you typically use the temp folder for this because you can write to the temp folder. Read, write, and execute the temp folder. Then I go back to the subclasses 40, which is the file function, and I do read. So this is why I needed that number. 59 takes me to the catch warnings function, which has the ability to import libraries, and 40 takes me to the file function, which has the ability to read files. So this mess will take an ls and put it in a temporary file and print the temporary file. And now I get the ls, which I appear to be in the root of the system, bin, boot, dev, etch. Looks like I'm getting uh, from the root of the system. So now there are just some flags. There's a couple of flags to find on there. There's one where I tell you exactly where to find it and print it out. And there's another one where you have to search the server. For the, and find it, so you'll have to inject. Now you've got a system where you can inject operating system commands, so you should be able to find those flags. And that's what I wanted to show you, the hands-on project for template injection.